lucky today to be have the panel chaired by Professor Ignacio Tirado, just, who um, teaches commercial, corporate, and insolvency law at the Universidad Autónoma of Madrid. He's a senior legal consultant at the World Bank's financial sector practice, and he was of counsel of the business restructuring and insolvency practice at Hogan Lovells until he joined the World Bank. Uh, Professor Tirado is a member of the executive and a director of the International Insolvency Institute where he's also a co-chair of our academic committee. He's the vice chair of the Pan-European Think Tank Conference of European Restructuring and Insolvency Law, or CERL, and he's represented the World Bank in UNCITRAL Working Group 5 in Spain in the, uh, in the III in the Working Group 4. Um, he's also a founding member of the academic board of European Banking Institute, an international fellow of the American College of Bankruptcy, and is Secretary General of UNIDROIT. And with that, I'll turn the panel over to Professor Tirado. Um, thank you, Lisa. Um, I hope you can all see me uh, and hear me. Um, I, I just should start by saying that um, some of the uh, things you said are a little bit outdated. I'm no longer a member of the executive uh, and the board of the III. I stepped down from those uh, shoes uh, a few uh, a few years ago. Uh, anyway, um, good evening from Rome. It's really nice to see you all there. Uh, it is really, really difficult not to be in New York again uh, this time when we all really thought that we would be able to make it. Um, apparently, a few weeks later, we would have been able to, to fly in from, from Europe, but not, not this early. So next time, we're very much looking forward to it. And uh, um, we are very hopeful that this uh, is going to be very soon over. Right, so um, our panel is going to be about uh, uh, micro, small and, and medium enterprises and, and its insolvency. Uh, we're talking here about um, around 90 to 95 of, of all the uh, um, uh, businesses in, in, in a country, depending on the country, uh, but it's a, it's a global number, that's how it is. Uh, it accounts usually from, from 30 to 60% of the workforce of a country, again, depending on the degree of development. Uh, in any case, the numbers are extremely important, as you can um, see. Uh, and yet it is interesting to see that for decades, the treatment of insolvency of micro, small and medium enterprises was completely ignored by legislators. It was uh, pretty much uh, left on the side by academics and, uh, um, and only a, few, a number of practitioners and, um, took interest in, in this type of, um, of insolvencies. Uh, the, the, not malfunctioning of MSME insolvencies in many countries took heavy tolls on the uh, insolvency systems of many countries. Um, it uh, Im implied it was a problem for the banking system, it was a problem for creditors, and it was indeed uh, a problem for courthouses, which were clogged with cases for little or no value at all. Um, so the legislator fortunately recently changed uh, and realize that there, there is a strong need to solve the problem of SME insolvency um, for a number of reasons, amongst others, uh, precisely to be able to um, use the resources of, of the judiciary and the courts uh, for more productive um, uses. Uh, and also to offer, obviously, uh, a good solution to the smaller uh, sector of, the, of, of our economies. Uh, this can be seen by the recent reform uh, initiatives that have taken place at, uh, in ANCITRAL, the European Commission, or for example, just to name one, the uh, relatively recent uh, amendment of the bankruptcy code of the United States uh, on the subject matter. In order to speak uh, about this uh, subject, we've got uh, an extraordinary panel with us, uh, which represent um, uh, each of them different portions, but all of them key for the uh, subject of MSME insolvency. Uh, I'm going to uh, present all of them together and in order of intervention. First, we have with us Andres Martinez, who's a, a good old friend of many years. Uh, he's a senior financial sector specialist at the World Bank Group. Uh, and um, he's been 
notwithstanding his appearance and his youth, he's already been a lawyer for more than 20 years. Um, he has contributed to the reform, assessment and reform of the law of insolvency and creditors' rights laws in many, many countries with the World Bank. Um, and in, on top of all of that, um, he is an Insol Fellow uh, and co-chairs the World Bank Insolvency Task Force. Um, he is, by the way, also a former champion of chess of Argentina when he was a child there. So he has everything. Um, then with, uh, after, after Andres, we have Judge Paul Bonafel, who is a, a US bankruptcy judge from the Northern District of Georgia, has been so for almost 20 years now. Um, he is, amongst other accolades to his distinction, a uh, recipient of the David Poland Achievement Award, uh, annually presented by the bankruptcy section of the Atlanta Bar Association, and um, a very well-known judge uh, in the United States and soon internationally as well. Uh, judge Bonafel uh, is also the author of a, uh, an excellent and extremely lengthy and detailed paper on the uh, system of, of um, treatment of insolvency, of, micro, of bankruptcy, of, of micro businesses. So no one better than him to speak to us about the uh, system in the United States and the reform that's taken place. And third, we have Colin Haig, who has been uh, an insolvency practitioner, a licensed one since 1989. So over 30 years of experience, he's been a partner at Neville Russell, Bercatilli, PwC, KPNG, BDO, um, and uh, uh, currently is the president of the R3 Association of Insolvency Practitioners in the United Kingdom, and he's going to be speaking to us uh, about um, the UK system. So without any further chat from my part, I'll give the floor to Andres. Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ignacio. Let's see if we can uh, put up the slides. Thank you, Shari. I know you're doing the magic in the background. Um, so let me let me uh, first of all explain why we're focusing on on MSME insolvency, particularly at the World Bank. Um, the, there's there's quite a few reasons, but I, I just wanted to highlight three of them. Um, first of all, the importance for global development, which cannot be understated. I think Ignacio gave some numbers, but basically globally the MSMEs represent 90% of the businesses worldwide. And, and it's more than 50% of worldwide employment they represent. So it's we're talking about a lot of a, a lot of different jobs and 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 in fact in emerging markets the, the majority of the formal jobs are generated by by micro, small and medium enterprises. So their importance for um for the global development cannot be uh, understated. Now, um, in the second place, it is also true that the, the pandemic and the COVID-19 and the lockdowns, of course, um, uh, particularly damaged and disproportionately uh, hit um, the, 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 the smaller firms. Uh, we're talking about um, a lot of um, firms that were affected in the service sectors, which are typically dominated by, by micro and small companies. So we're talking about uh, tourism, transportation, a lot of different, uh, um, a lot of different sectors that were were, were damaged, and that were where micro and small companies have a, a significant uh, participation. So this is this is the second reason. But the third one is is perhaps the most important that, that I want to touch um, touch upon today, and 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 that will be at the center of the discussion on uh, of, of this, which is. Do insolvency laws, um, are insolvency laws well prepared to deal with smaller firms? And, and I think the answer to this question we'll see um, in the next slide. So let's move on, please. Um, let, let's skip the question on whether there will be a wave of bankruptcies, which was something that I think has been quite controversial so far. And uh, frankly, it's, it's, uh, it, it begins the response with micro and small companies anything to avoid formal insolvency proceedings this is this is um, a reality that 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 happens worldwide and sometimes uh, while sometimes it is impossible uh, to avoid them they 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 in fact are are, are unprepared to 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 file for for this process sometimes they just lack incentives or lack information or simply cannot 
uh, meet the requirements to file. Uh, many laws, and, and I'm sure that, that you're familiar with this, many laws have very extensive requirements of perhaps even audited balance sheets to, to be able to file for insolvency, and, and, and micro and small enterprises are, are generally do not meet these, um, these requirements. The second one is, is that many laws contemplate, um, of course, a system of, of, of voting uh, the plan, and, and that requires um, creditors to be active and participate in the process, and of course, vote in favor of a proposal. And this, um, this normally has a problem in, the, in micro, and, and this, the smaller the case, the more problematic this approach is, simply because creditors just don't care so much about these type of cases. And, and I know this sounds counterintuitive because I know we're talking about, a, you know, to a very sophisticated audience that normally has large cases, but, but the reality for those uh, practitioners that deal mostly with, with smaller cases is that creditors uh, are, are normally quite passive. Um, so accessing financing during, during insolvency is already complicated in most emerging jurisdictions. Uh, even those countries that have incorporated in their legislation something similar to the 363 in the US or some sort of super priority for fresh financing still have a lot of problems attracting financing. And particularly for this type of companies, uh, the bottlenecks are even, are even higher. Um, obviously, there is a gray zone between uh, business and personal insolvency regimes, um, which is uh, treated differently in different countries, uh, but, but that generates even more complexities. And, uh, and uh, they, 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 the smaller companies are also um, sometimes less likely to have sufficient assets, unencumbered assets to fund insolvency proceedings. And while we initially, um, we're working on, a, on, on the assumption that, that, uh, that there should be some sort of mechanism, specific insolvency remedy or insolvency proceeding for uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. The reality is that the medium enterprises are users of insolvency systems. So we decided to just put them uh, aside and, and give them the chance of, of, of accessing the normal insolvency process. Now, um, in comparative law, you can find a lot of different simplified regimes or, 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 or micro enterprises specific regimes. Um, so what we have been working at the World Bank is to try, if we move on to the next slide, um, is to try and, and capture some of these um, uh, developments. So we started working in 2017 in the report, in the report on the treatment of the MSME insolvency. This report draws heavily from a work that, that, that Ignacio and, and others uh, have been doing in, in this area uh, since, since, since quite a while already. Um, and, uh, and basically we summarize there the, some of the main uh, problems that, that micro and small enterprises face um, as compared to, to, to large enterprises. And, and then there are some proposals that we put forward in 2018 and uh, we have a lot of, um, of experts consultative meetings um, in 2019 and 20, which culminated this year in April, uh, amending, some, uh, amending the World Bank uh, insolvency uh, principles. Uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with them, probably not, but basically it's a set of, of principles, uh, particularly the C principles that cover the insolvency process from, from commencement to liquidation, even though it has uh, limited rules on liquidation. So basically, as from April 2021, 20, the World Bank has uh, enacted some principles uh, for, for micro and, and small enterprises insolvency, which leads me to the final slide. Uh, Shari, if you can please um, move to that one, um, which is basically the, 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 the main aspects that the World Bank principles cover. Um, first of all, trying to come up with convenient, inexpensive, and easily accessible proceedings. And I, I want to emphasize this last part, the easily accessible proceedings is something very important because in emerging economies, you'll find very often that judges are reluctant to open insolvency processes. The fear of fraud is considerable. And this is something that, that, that for, for many US practitioners maybe may sound strange, but, but, but it's a reality in most, in most economies uh, that, that we find. And it's a significant deterrent 
for, for micro and small companies to access uh, insolvency proceedings. Obviously, minimizing procedural formalities. One of the main issues that we found pretty much any, everywhere is the elimination of creditors committees, for example, um, and, 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 and many others, of course, um, number of hearings and, and some other formalities um, that are typically eliminated for this type of, of cases. Um, an easy conversion between simplified and ordinary, of course, if more assets uh, show up or, or if the pool of creditors is significantly uh, larger than initially envisaged or vice versa, there should be a provisions that contemplate a conversion from one process to another. Um, um, we at the World Bank, we insisted that there needs to be some sort of approval of the reorganization plan by a certain majority of creditors, but that the ideal scenario is that the implicit, there is an implicit vote, meaning the silence is a, an affirmative vote on that, on that proposal. Um, so the plan would be approved um, in, in, in case even when creditors don't, don't have to express an affirmative vote. Um, of course, management of business by the debtor, this is something that, that, that is uh, quite natural for most of you. Um, in some cases, we, we, uh, we, we agree that an independent third party may be necessary, but probably not in all cases. And I will defer to Ignacio, who has made a, 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 very, a very interesting proposal uh, along this line. So I, I think it's, uh, uh, but, but we increasingly see um, that perhaps uh, insolvency administrators are, are not necessary for, for, for very small cases. The remuneration is also an issue, right? And, and this is something that can't be denied. Um, a discharge of good faith natural person entrepreneurs, this is something absolutely essential that uh, the European Commission has been emphasizing in the European Directive, as many of you are familiar. And finally, uh, last but not, not least, the institutional considerations. Uh, we've seen some countries that have given these micro processes to chambers of commerce, for example, right? And to other, you know, smaller jurisdictions. I think this is a very good idea in general, perhaps not necessarily chambers of commerce, which may be not, uh, you know, cons consistent with some constitutional or, or, or judicial uh, systems. But what I'm saying is trying to separate the really large and important cases from the very small cases is generally a good idea. I mean, I've, I've worked in quite a few countries and I've, I've seen many, many judges that need to deal with uh, perhaps five, six super large cases. And then they have hundreds and hundreds of cases that, that take the vast majority of their time um, that are perhaps either have no assets or it's just merely uh, following procedural steps that, that, that are quite pointless. So I think the, the, the separation of, of large cases and small cases is, is something quite, quite important. Um, with this, I, I finish. So next slide is basically saying thank you. I am very much looking forward to hearing the, 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 the next speakers and, and, and the Q&A session. Thank you. I appreciate it. Gracias, Andres. Thanks very much. Judge, floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, I'm happy to uh, be on this program with such a distinguished panel. I wish I could be in New York. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, subchapter five, which is the relatively newly enacted provision of the bankruptcy code. Chapter 11, of course, permits entities or individuals to seek to reorganize with the exception of some types of debtors like banks and insurance companies. <clears throat> Effective February 19, 2020, the Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019 enacted a new subchapter of chapter 11, subchapter five, to govern reorganization of an eligible small business. Next slide. To be eligible, a debtor must meet three basic requirements. One, it must be engaged in commercial or business activities. The term has been broadly defined to include a debtor with no current active business operations that is engaged in wind-up activities, such as disposition of assets, dealing with creditors, preparation of tax filings, and similar matters. Two, the debtor's aggregate, secured and unsecured, non-contingent and liquidated debts must not exceed the debt limit, which due to the COVID pandemic is temporarily $7.5 million. 
The limit reverts to about 2.7 million on March 27, 2022, unless Congress extends the higher limit. The third requirement is that at least 50% of the debt must arise from commercial or business activities. This requirement is usually applicable in individual cases to separate out individuals who are not actively in business. There are some exclusions. A public company cannot be a sub five debtor and an affiliate of a public company cannot be in sub five either. In addition, a single asset real estate debtor is not eligible for subchapter five. So why was subchapter five enacted? Insolvency practitioners, bankruptcy judges, and academics have been advocating special reorganization provisions for small business cases almost since enactment of the current bankruptcy code in 1978. They have generally agreed that Chapter 11 is too slow, too complex, and too costly for most small to medium-sized enterprises. In addition, Two requirements for confirmation of a Chapter 11 plan over the objections of creditors create obstacles for an MSME. The first is the absolute priority rule, which prohibits existing equity from retaining its equity interest unless creditors are paid in full, absent the infusion of new value. The second is the requirement that at least one class of creditors accept the plan. Although neither requirement is necessarily fatal and workarounds may exist, overcoming these obstacles involves time and possible litigation, leading to additional costs and, of course, uncertainty in the process. From the standpoint of creditors, insolvency professionals also noted that many smaller cases, although doomed to failure at some point, could nevertheless languish in a Chapter 11 case for a considerable time resulting in additional administrative expenses and losses to creditors. The bankruptcy code does have two other chapters that permit reorganization of some MSMEs under some circumstances. These are chapters 12 and 13. Both permit confirmation of a plan without creditor voting and without a requirement that any class or creditor accept the plan, and neither has an absolute priority rule. Both chapters 12 and 13 provide for retention and management of assets by the debtor and the appointment of a trustee to administer the case, monitor the debtor's business, advise the court on whether the debtor is complying with requirements of the bankruptcy laws and whether the plan meets applicable confirmation requirements and make disbursements to creditors. The problem with chapters 12 and 13 is that they are not available for most MSME debtors. Chapter 13 is limited to natural persons. An entity cannot be in a Chapter 13 case. Moreover, the debt limits for Chapter 13 are limited to 420,000 in unsecured debts and about a million and a quarter in secured debts. Chapter 12 is limited to family farmers with a debt limit of 10 million and family fishers with a debt limit of about 2 million. So how does chapter five respond to these problems? The legislative history to subchapter five states that its purpose is to streamline the process by which small business debtors reorganize and rehabilitate their financial affairs. Certainly we would all agree with that objective, but insolvency professionals and insolvency organizations certainly had different ideas about what an ideal reorganization law for MSMEs would look like. What we got was a combination of several things designed to simplify and expedite the reorganization process, increase fiduciary monitoring and supervision, and increase judicial involvement in the case. Next slide. Subchapter 5, in some ways, adopts the Chapter 12 and 13 models. The debtor remains in possession of its assets unless removed for cause but a trustee is appointed to administer the case. Actually, I, uh, we're okay. I think I skipped a slide. Uh, the debtor remains in possession of its assets unless removed for cause, but a trustee is appointed to administer the case. There is no creditors committee unless the court orders otherwise. Sub five contemplates that the trustee will have a monitoring and oversight role. 
Although not expressly stated, it appears that the trustee in some respects is responsible for looking after the interests of creditors and as such is somewhat of a substitute for a creditors committee. A unique duty of the subchapter five trustee is the duty to facilitate the development of a consensual plan of reorganization. No other chapter in the bankruptcy code imposes this duty on the trustee. Sub five changes traditional chapter 11 procedures in several ways. First, the court must hold a status conference within 60 days of the filing of the case and the debtor must file a report 14 days in advance of the conference, stating the steps it has taken and will take to attain a consensual plan of reorganization. Second, the debtor must file a plan within 90 days of filing unless the court orders otherwise. There is no deadline for confirmation of a plan, however. Third, there is a requirement that the debtor file, there is no requirement that the debtor file a disclosure statement that provides information about the debtor in the plan unless the court orders otherwise. As in chapter 12 and 13 cases, a sub five debtor is the only person who may file a plan. Although unsecured creditors and the trustee in a chapter 12 or 13 case can seek a post modification of the plan, post confirmation modification of the plan, only the debtor may do so in a sub five case. Although sub five is modeled on chapter 12 and 13 practice, the chapter 11 confirmation procedures and rules generally apply with some important changes that make it easier for a debtor to obtain confirmation of a plan over the objections of dissenting creditors. Don't change the slide here because I moved too fast earlier. Um, the rules for consensual confirmation are unchanged except for the elimination of the projected disposable requirement that an unsecured creditor may invoke in a traditional Chapter 11 case of an individual. The rules for cram down confirmation over the objection of a dissenting secured creditor remain the same as in a traditional case. Sub five changes cram down requirements with regard to unsecured claims in three important ways. First, the requirement that at least one class accept the plan is eliminated. The court can, can, can confirm a plan even if no one accepts it. Second, the absolute priority rule is replaced by a projected disposable income requirement applicable to entities as well as to individuals. The debtor must pay projected disposable income for a three to five year period as the court determines. The projected disposable income requirement raises a lot of questions that the case law will have to address. In summary, sub five is designed to expedite the process and reduce costs by one, requiring a mandatory status conference, two, imposing a 90 day filing requirement for the plan, and three, eliminating the committee of unsecured creditors and the requirement of a disclosure statement unless the court orders otherwise. The changes in the confirmation rules likewise help to expedite the case and make it less expensive by removing obstacles to confirmation. The requirement of the status conference adds judicial supervision. The existence of the trustee in the case obviously enhances fiduciary monitoring and supervision. The trustee's role may also contribute significantly to expediting the case and reducing costs. A trustee may be able to assist the debtor in understanding and fulfilling its duties in the case, in preparing and filing a plan, and in obtaining financial and business assistance where needed. A trustee may also be helpful in facilitating confirmation as an independent intermediary in negotiations between the debtor and creditors, something like a mediator but not quite, since the trustee still has fiduciary duties to creditors. Insolvency cases usually involve no good choices, only less bad ones. As somewhat of a neutral, the trustee is in a position to help both debtors and creditors face the realities of an unpleasant situation and make business decisions that are in the best interests of everyone. So how is it working? I don't have statistics or other empirical data, data on how it's working, but anecdotal reports from judges and insolvency professionals across the country indicate that it is working well. 
Debtors that can reorganize are getting plans confirmed and creditors are receiving money earlier than in traditional cases. It also appears that the legislation is accomplishing the objective of sorting out those that can't be reorganized, resulting either in dismissal or conversion at an early stage so that cases are not lingering in Chapter 11 to the detriment of creditors. The trustee feature also seems to be working reasonably well and as intended. Lawyers involved in sub five cases report either that tr the trustee's role has been useful or is at least not harmful. I hope this has been helpful and I appreciate your attention. I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the program. Thanks very much, Judge. That was very interesting to see how, you know, some of the uh, procedural measures were very interesting, but I should especially uh, make reference to the uh, removal of the uh, rigidity around the absolute priority rule. The European directive tried to include that, included it actually. And uh, there was such turmoil that uh, some colleagues of ours in the academia called it the end of civil European civilization as we know it. Uh, if you will allow me, perhaps we can discuss about that later. Uh, okay, the floor is now uh, over to Colin. Colin. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome from London. When you won't be surprised to hear it's absolutely pouring down with rain. Uh, you also won't be surprised to hear that we do things slightly differently in the UK. Uh, there are one or two idiosyncrasies, which I'm going to touch upon now. Sherry, could I have my second slide, please? should start R3 what? Just a little bit about R3, because I think this nicely illustrates what I'm talking about. R3 is uh, a fairly broad church organisation representing the UK restructuring profession, lawyers, financiers, PE, uh, 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 government employees, and of course, insolvency practitioners. And here's the thing, we've got about 4,000 members um, but most insolvency practitioners in the UK, generally speaking, are not lawyers, they're accountants. Uh, and I, I, I work, my background is working in accountancy firms. So um, in uh, 1798, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte wisely observed, l'Angleterre est une nation de boutiquier, and apologies for my appalling French, but he's right, the UK was a nation of shopkeepers then, um, and it still is. In fact, uh, Josiah Tucker, Dean of Gloucester, said it in 1766, and uh, Adam Smith said it again in 1776. So between the three of them, um, not much has changed. Um, the UK has currently about 5.9 million um, active SMEs and employees 61% of the working population. What we call SMEs is organizations typically employing less than 250 people. Um, the UK insolvency stats for September 21, that's the quarter we're out on Friday. And as uh, government support measures start to come to an end now, furloughs finishing, um, it's not surprising, I suppose, that liquidation numbers, insolvent liquidation numbers are now back up to pre COVID levels. Can we have the second slide, please, Sherry? Um, it should start traditional tools. My screen is so small and my eyesight is so bad. So essentially, we have three traditional means of dealing with SME insolvency in the UK, which I'll just touch upon. This will be known to, to audi your audience, but if you want some more granular uh, and, and legal analysis about the procedures, there's a very nice slide pack in your, in your pack, I hope. Um, which, which will give you more detail. Essentially, uh, administration has been one of the favoured tools and we've refined a process um, which we call pre-pack, where businesses are essentially marketed in the period immediately pre preceding the formal insolvency event. Uh, we call it accelerated M&A. And if, uh, assuming that uh, we can find a, a buyer for the business as a quasi-going concern, an administrator is then appointed to consummate the deal um, this is usually popular with management because at that stage, the entity is usually so distressed that management don't want to make, make, take the risks of, of selling the business as a going concern. And the, and the administrator has the ability, obviously, to convey the business assets without uh, adopting, without the purchaser adopting the liabilities, or at least most of the liabilities. Slight uh, modification is that there is now a, a mandatory obligation for pre-packed sales 
um, to connected parties to be fed through an evaluator. An evaluator is an independent party who must express an opinion as to whether or not the, the, the pre-pack is a good result for creditors um, in all the circs. So I still anticipate that administration will be a major tool to be used by us as, 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 as um, failure rates start to pick up in the UK. We've also evolved a process called company voluntary arrangement. So most retail um, uh, in, in, uh, real, uh, restructurings, reorganisations in the UK have been structured by way of a company voluntary arrangement. I think it's an extremely pragmatic tool. It's a contractual arrangement essentially between um, um, creditors. Uh, it's it's slightly fall, fall into uh, hard times, I would say, because of a number of disputes that have arisen be between uh, landlords and supervisors in voluntary arrangements where, where essentially the landlord feels he's been unfairly treated. Um, the case law suggests that thus far very few of those concerns have actually been um, uh, legally su su supportable. Um, but I do think it's fair to say that the, 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 the reputation of CVA as a process, the integrity of CVA as a process has been slightly tarnished and, and we need to rethink quite how we use that. Um, there is going to be a process introduced by UK government in March of next year for an arbitration between landlords and, and tenants um, for, for arrears of rent, but there's some way to go before those arrangements are, 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 um, are finalised. And then, as I say, there's a traditional tool of liquidation, and there are various different types of li li liquidation, essentially creditors' voluntary liquidations, which is a, a process initiated by management, and compulsory liquidation, which is a process um, initiated by the court. But by and large, the outcome is the same. We're talking about insolvency liquidations. And broadly, as I said to you, um, numbers of insolvency liquidations are up. Now, there is a school of thought which says that because of increased regulation in the area of prepack, we might see more business sales affected by management in the period immediately preceding an insolvent liquidation than a liquidator appointed to clean up what's left of the entity. I don't know, uh, remains to be seen. In a way, I hope not, because I think that actually as a profession, um, we've evolved the prepack process to quite a high level. And I think it's a very useful way of structuring a deal, a business transfer, you know, which wouldn't be possible by way of a share sale. And uh, excitingly, we've got some brand new kit introduced in May last year um, under SEGA, the Corporate Insolvency Governance Act, which essentially introduces two new concepts to the UK, uh, a moratorium process with a monitor, and that's designed to give uh, management uh, 20 days, extendable by another 20 days, instance of creditors, um, uh, air cover essentially from process, it's binding on, on all creditors. In order to get a moratorium, it's, it's, it's necessary for management to identify a licensed insolvency practice, you know, somebody like me that's prepared to agree that a moratorium uh, will, will avoid an insolvency. Um, the, the burden upon monitors can be high. Um, unfortunately, so far, I think probably because the level of, of government support by way of um, COVID-backed loan schemes and uh, furlough and forgiveness on tax. There hasn't really been a burning platform requiring SME management to do very much up until now. Possibly for that reason that there really haven't been very many um, monitor ap applications um, so far. Um, I think that's a shame. I think it's potentially a very useful piece of kit. There's, there's, there's quite a lot of concern amongst my colleagues around the risk profile attaching to monitors if you get it wrong. But, you know, notwithstanding that, I think it's a very interesting innovation. And if I, if I found an appropriate victim, personally, I'd be very interested to see if we could use that, to, that process. And of course, we've got the restructuring plan. And what's interesting about the restructuring plan is that for the first time in UK, we've got a cross-class cram down um, protocol which we've never had um, and it has been used uh, on a number of occasions we've got about 15 precedent cases now but actually um, to your point Ignacio these are all big deals these are all great big quoted uh, company deals um, and, and it's, it's, it's somewhat paradox that, that so far it's not really been tested on an SME or even a mid-corp. There's one case, Amicus, which is arguably mid-corp, but we, we need some more test cases. And I think it's an extremely useful piece of kit. One of the interesting things about it is that in the UK, it's not technically an insolvency process. So the sort of um, scrutiny that management routinely come under um, in an insolvency is, is not gonna be the same in the restructuring plan. So I, I have great hopes um, for restructuring plans in the UK. Speaking to a Dutch lawyer the other day, it tells me that most SME 
insolvencies in Holland um, are, are, are dealt with by way of restructuring plans. So I, I think it's got great potential. And my final slide, please, Sherry, if we may, which should start with paradigms are shifting. And what I mean by that is that um, it's the bulk of my career, uh, which started in 1979, the UK restructuring market has really been dominated by the big four accountancy firms, but that's changing pretty quickly. So two of them have already divested themselves of their restructuring teams, KPMG, my old firm, and Deloitte's uh, have, have both sold off their restructuring capability. EY and PwC maintain it, but there have been a, 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 a raft of new um, firms, uh, boutique firms um, uh, active in the UK, Alex, Alvarez, FTI, really at the top end of the market. And, and um, you know, it, 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 we're in a place where it's, 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 it's absolutely uh, novel to have PE investments conducting restructuring business. So it's, it's quite a difference. And not only that, you know, traditionally SMEs were, were financed by way of the banks. Uh, a lot of SMEs these days aren't. They're, they're, they're financed by way of debt funds, asset-based lenders, whole new funding structures. And whereas the banks, um, you know, massively regulated in the UK, and their behavior was, was, let's say, quite predictable. Um, with these new um, debt providers, it's quite hard to call quite how they're gonna deal with an uptick. You know, um, a lot of them really are untested in this area. So um, when I say paradigms are shifting, just about every aspect of the UK market has, has, has moved significantly, I, I would say. And therefore it's quite difficult to call with any certainty um, what's gonna happen. We've got a bunch of new stakeholders, as I said, um, new purveyors of, of restructuring services, new debt providers, whole raft of distressed PE houses, some of whom are, are, are hooking up with R3, which is interesting because it makes our organisation much more representative of the wider restructuring community. So in a nutshell, um, Haig's prognosis for how we're going to deal with uh, the uptick, which I'm anticipating. Yeah, look, broadly, we've, we've got some really, I think, interesting new procedures. I, I think that the, the, the process of consultation preceding SEGA was one of the best I've seen. Government are um, communicating in, in a way that I've never seen them do before. And I think as a profession, we're, we're responding that to that in a, in a much more engaged fashion. We're more joined up, we're better communicating, we're more consistent and generally uh, as supportive of, of each other as we can be. So, so all that... Um, I think bodes quite well. If I've got one um, concern is that actually there aren't that many people left in the UK that know how to do this stuff. There are about 2000 licensed insolvency practitioners in the UK. And if, I, if, if, if the uptick is as significant that as I fear it may be, I, I have concerns about whether or not we're gonna have enough. Um, you know, I said the same thing around about Lehman time and, and we coped. And, and one, of the, one of the other concerns I have is that there is finite resource within the judiciary to support us. What we've got is excellent. You know, it's more accessible than it ever has been. Some really switched on judgments we're getting out of the UK court these days. But at the end of the day, there aren't that many judges that really know how to, how to do this stuff. So I think, you know, the economy um, is fundamentally in reasonable shape. We've got a lot of capital interested in investing in the UK. We've got some really switched on procedures. I, you know, if I have one nagging doubt, it's about the sort of um, the, the resource available to deal with what, what, what might be coming our way. And that's my um, my elevator pitch, Nasio. Thanks a lot, Colin. Um, so from your overview, uh, which was indeed very interesting, I, I would um, derive that there is no specific um, procedure in the UK for MSMEs, but rather they can choose and pick from the wider array that you've described. So I was wondering whether that might be actually suited uh, for the specific characteristics of, of the smallest businesses that remains to be seen following the conclusion, I mean, from the landscape that you've presented to us. Yes. Anyway, let's see uh, if there are questions from, from, from the floor or from the audience. Um, if there are questions from the floor, I imagine we will be able to see it. Um, I just see the room with no one uh, there. <laughs> okay, well. Are there just in the oh. 
New York, are there questions in New York regarding the panel for the panels? Are there any remotely on screen? There, sorry, there are. There is one. Um, I see one here uh, from uh, Rasha Al Sugar, who has a question for Andres for the World Bank representative, saying, "What do you think about the MSME procedure in the Saudi bankruptcy law of 2018? Um, would that be the perfect procedure for MSMEs?" <laughs> Andres? Is there a perfect procedure for MSMEs? <laughs> I think the, 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 answer, the answer is, I, I doubt there is a perfect procedure, uh, at least uh, if we, have, uh, meaning in, in an am, abstract, uh, a, and only in the letter of the law, I mean, it depends, each jurisdiction needs to come up with their perfect procedure for, MS, for MSMEs, right? So I think uh, the institutional setup that we were discussing in the panel, I mean, clearly is one of the determining factors of, of success of the procedure itself. I mean, my recollection about the Saudi law, uh, I did have the opportunity to review it a few times, and, and I do remember that it has some uh, MSME uh, specific provisions. I think one of the the interesting thing that, that the Saudi system does, because it can afford it, is to set up a bankruptcy agency that is uh, well-staffed and with a lot of technology that processes all the no-asset cases, which is called the administrative liquidations, right? So I think that that's super helpful. But whenever one discusses it with emerging countries, why don't you set up a system like that for no asset cases? They say, I mean, it, it, it's very tough because it's resource intensive, it's 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 resource consuming, and it's a, a you know it's a, it's a it's a high cost for the governments to set up that system. I think the interesting part of the question, uh, besides the, the the Saudi specific context, which is of course I defer to the Saudi experts, which I'm sure that there must be someone in the in the audience uh, with that expertise. I think it's whether there is a perfect system uh, for MSMEs. And I think for, for this panel, uh, it's clear that the, there are different approaches at least. Um, I mean, the, the, the US uh, recent redefinition of its approach to MSMEs and the UK, you know, that gives all these opportunities to pick and choose some from, from the general system are, are two clearly different approaches. But if you look at the, for example, the India new law, the, the Myanmar also has a new law that, that focuses on MSMEs. Singapore has a specific MSME proceeding. So increasingly we are seeing a trend from many countries to pass MSME specific proceedings. And I think this is something that legislators should take into account. And uh, please don't copy a law if you're a legislator, but do get inspiration from what the US has done, from what other countries have done around the world. And uh, obviously not to forget the Spanish proposal, Ignacio. <laughs> uh, uh, and and, and there, is, there is really a lot out there that has been happening in the last three, five years. And I think that that's the that's the key message. I think um, the, the, all these developments. Thank you. Thanks, Andres. If there are no other questions in New York, um, then um, I will make a very quick uh, question to the panelists. Uh, one of the things that hasn't really been um, um, talked about, considered in this panel. Uh, which might have a, a huge potential for improving the systems of MSME insolvency is technology. Um, all too often, um, um, technology, uh, the use of templates which are available online, the possibility of debtors to directly file um, um, the uh, um, documents that they want to file, getting online um, also uh, counseling uh, seems to be a way to lower the cost uh, of, of the procedures. Um, and this is something which is apparently part of the reform in many places nowadays. Uh, but uh, um, to what extent, in your opinion, can technology be an important part of the solution of MSME insolvency? Uh, or this is just something which can generally help streamline procedure in, in insolvency 
generally and is not necessarily an MSME thing. Um, who would like to take that? Because um, that's the way reform is going forward in many countries. Uh, I'll open the batting if you like, Ignacio. Uh, yeah, we, sure. we, we, we've experimented with this filing documents um, electronically, holding creditors' meetings virtually. I think, um, to your point, I, th I think it has the potential to massively uh, improve the, the speed and efficiency of process. I don't think it's actually going to, uh, of itself, improve the outcome from SME restructurings, workouts or, or, or insolvencies. I think that's really down to um, commercial criteria. Um, I think that what it might do is, is to make them more uh, affordable, more cost effective perhaps, and it might make the regulators' lives a bit easier. But broadly, um, I think that you know getting the best result is going to be down to old-fashioned commercial positioning. Um, to, 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 to well-equipped, uh, well-resourced professionals doing good deals, like it always has been. Right. Thank you. Anyone else would like to say anything? Ignacio, as a question, um, yep. in the US at least, where bankruptcies are so expensive, there's sometimes a practitioner view that if you can't afford the bankruptcy, you can negotiate deals with creditors outside of bankruptcy, that you just go to everyone and say, either agree to a haircut, agree to a compromise, or we're all going to lose money. So with having these simplified proceedings where you have less creditor rights and you have more ability to force compromise on creditors in the formal proceedings, do you think it changes the bargaining dynamic between debtors and creditors to give creditors more power, or is it viewed as really being a debtor-friendly uh, solution. Who would like to take that? Well, uh, Judge, I, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll take on. a stab at it from the standpoint of the United States that, that, that there are other ways to do, do, do non-bankruptcy things, receiverships, assignments for the benefit of creditors. And in some respects, those some practitioners think those are less expensive than Chapter 11 cases. Um, doing an out-of-court workout is is somewhat difficult because of getting everybody that has to agree. You have to get unanimous consent, and especially in smaller companies, it, it's tough to get people who even care. So, and then there, there's also the possibility of, of one outlier blowing up the whole deal. So, uh, I'm, at least in the American practice, I'm, I'm used to the, 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 the prospect of, of a successful reorganization, um, at least where, where, the, where all of the unsecured creditors are involved. If, if there's a major bond hedge fund or major group of creditors and it's a renegotiation of a of a major debt facility then th obviously that can work but if you're talking about having to work out something with with the the whole body of unsecured creditors it it seems to me that's somewhat difficult and then you got the problem Thanks. i guess in the public sphere if it's public debt the the trustees sometimes can't agree to to go along with the terms even if they wanted to because the documents don't let them yeah i think i would echo, i would echo all of that from the uk i think it's an extremely high risk proposition and usually you'll get someone holding out um for for unfair advantage and if management get this wrong um there's a potential for personal liability for the transaction to be un, 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 undone by by subsequently appointed office holder Broadly, I think DIY is, is, is one area where it's probably not a great idea, in my, in my humble opinion. Um, I do have a, a quick question, though, uh, which is related to all of this, which would be, let's take the uh, paradigmatic example of, of an MSME insolvency, in which debtor has $100,000 um, left and, uh, uh, let's say, euro, to take it out of the, UK, of the American system, uh, euro left, and uh, and uh, half of that has been already seized in a bank freezed uh, um, in a bank account by one of the creditors. Then it has uh, two or three assets, all of which are pre-allocated to secure creditors. Uh, 
um, and a couple of assets which have very, very little liquidation value. Uh, in that case in which really there is a, a balance sheet insolvency, very unsecured credits are going to see little or nothing at all, and most assets are predefined. What is the sense of involving an insolvency practitioner? Oh, for me, the, the short answer is that it's around containing the risk. Why, why, why take on yet more risk of criticism where, where an independent party can, can own the responsibility for the orderly wind down of the entity's affairs and, and you've therefore contained your, your exposure to litigation? You know, if you try and do it yourself, you might save a few pennies maybe, but broadly, you're opening yourself up to, 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 to risk of legal proceedings for potentially six years, you know, from management's point of view. No, I, I take that, Colin. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I, I, let me rephrase the question, because obviously um, it, 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 we, we can all have our idea as to whether it, it's convenient to actually yes. have a, a trustee or an insolvency practitioner. We can argue that one way or another, but to make it mandatory, like, as is the case in many countries, in many cases, in a, in a case like this, would that make sense or perhaps not? That's the question, isn't it? Well, it's massively open to abuse, isn't it? That's the problem by, by management that, that don't work to high standards of ethical standards, you know, are not regulated. I mean, broadly, you know, you're, you're, you're relying upon management to do something which we're all spend years training to do. Right. I think it's quite high okay. risk. I've... It, it also so, depends, sorry, have... Ignacio. Ah, okay. You know, I, I was going to, to complete that that, that answer, I mean, uh, from, from, from at least from my angle, it depends a lot on the way the system is designed. In many, in many countries, the assets, even the encumbered assets that you mentioned that there were in the state are still part of the state and therefore have to be sold by the insolvency administrator. Again, we can, we can discuss whether this is a good or a bad policy, but uh, many systems are designed that way. And in some other systems, the secure creditors can sell it outside of the insolvency process. But uh, there, there is a coexistence of those two different types of approaches. No? So the need for an appointment or not depends also on the design of the system, I think. Of course, of course. Well, it was, it was a general question. There are also, uh, and this is where technology comes in now, it is a trend to create platforms to liquidate the assets in which the debtor itself without a need of an IP would just pour the assets onto the platform which would then be liquidated online uh, so, well, just to give some ideas, I, we do have a question, but uh, you have to answer that in one minute, and this is for you. Uh, what are the pros and cons in the revised World Bank principles of creditor silence being deemed as approval of the plan? In one minute, I can tell you only that uh, the, 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 there is only pros in the, in the way the World Bank principles treat this topic. <laughs> No, I mean, look, uh, the, 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 so if you give me one minute, that's the answer. Uh, no, I mean, uh, the, the issue of creditor silence has been, uh, you know, creditor passivity is one of the problems. Uh, and as such, the, the, the possibility in, in case of a, vote, of a plan voting, the, the, those creditors that don't express a negative vote uh, are counted as a, as affirmative. This is something, this is not new. Many legislations already do it. No? So I, I think that that's a good way to go. And of course, there is a, a, a lot of sensitivity, particularly in emerging countries where fraud is, a, is an issue. And you will find always policymakers being very concerned about anything that looks like a, an attack on creditors' rights. But this is a very, this is a longer discussion. I think uh, that's kind of the glimpse and, and I do encourage to read the, the, the World Bank principles revised on this topic. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Um, 30 seconds each for a final word uh, and we are right on time. Judge, you, you start. Anything you'd like to uh, say to, to finish? Thank you. I've, I have uh, very much enjoyed this discussion on the, on the, just to follow up a little bit on the passivity point, the, the American the American view of that in the smaller cases is that we're not going to deal with creditor voting. Uh, chapter 12, Chapter 13, and Subchapter 5. And it seems to me that, that in many cases that makes a lot of sense because, as, as your hypo sort of indicated, you have a major secured creditor who's 
controlling everything and maybe a couple of other un uh, encumbered assets and um, the unsecured creditors are dead anyway. And so getting them involved in the process of voting is may not be useful, but in any event, um, thank you for your time and attention. Thanks, that's very useful. Uh, Colin, 30 seconds. I never cease to be dismayed by the lack of creditor engagement and what we're trying to do to get their money back. Frankly, it depresses me in most cases. And the bottom line is there's no such thing as a model process. You know, some things we do quite well, some things we could do better. What, what makes a difference? People doing good deals. Thanks a lot, Colin. Andres, final word. The final word on, on, on this topic, I mean, I, I think it's a, they always keep in mind the institutional setup. That's the key, even in particularly when designing anything that may affect creditors' rights. On the other, on the most important part, I greatly enjoyed this panel. I greatly, I, I, I want to thank the IIII for this invitation. And, uh, and I want to thank you uh, as co-panelists, as a moderator. Thank you so much. And, and, and of course, to the audience, I hope next time I can make it to New York or, or wherever it takes place. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot, Andres. Thanks, Judge. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, everyone, for your attention. And good night from Rome. Only one minute above time. Thanks. <clears throat> Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. It was great. Thank you for an excellent panel on how we're tackling the MSMEs. We now in the room have a half hour break until four o'clock. Our last panel at four is on distressed investing. So everyone can take a break and we'll log back on virtually.